Okay, thanks, Dylan. So I'm going to uh, structure the talk today mostly around uh, natural history and human interest, a little bit of uh, conservation issues, which is really why Hint Wood Products got into studying mountain goats in the first place. Uh, personal background, uh, before I came to Alberta some 24 years ago, I lived in BC and uh, used to spend a lot of time hunting these guys. There are parts over there on the table. Um, and I, I, the reason I uh, hunted them, I guess, is uh, I, I believe that uh, time spent uh, where goats live is uh, time well spent, and you can't really go wrong crawling around on cliffs where there's not goats. And then after I came to Alberta and we discovered that we had, uh, well, we didn't, it wasn't a discovery, we already knew that there was a canyon dwelling herd of mountain goats on our forest management area. Uh, we got involved with that because we were interested in long-term conservation of the goats and being able to uh, harvest in the areas surrounding the canyon. So I'll just jump right in. Um, not all of these photos are mine, and uh, generally the slightly fuzzy ones aren't. Uh, the, the sharper ones are. I tried uh, as much as I could to collect uh, uh, pictures that uh, would show a little bit about this critter, this amazing critter. Uh, Oriamnos americanus, it's the only representative of its, uh, of its genus anywhere in the world. It's not really closely related to anything else. Uh, the closest relatives are in Europe. Uh, the, uh, the Chamonix, um, Chamois, um, but it, it really doesn't have any close modern relatives. It's sort of related to antelopes, it's sort of related to goats, but it's neither an antelope nor a goat. Um, amnos in Greek means uh, lamb, uh, so that's where the original name came from because they thought it might have been related to sheep at the time. These critters are adapted to life in the clouds, life higher than any other large animal in North America, very steep terrain. Uh, their long white coats um, are making them very well adapted to winter conditions. They're able to survive cold and uh, other uh, winter conditions that uh, no other animal can survive. And in fact, that probably limits their range in North America. They're not found where it gets too hot. They're the alpine specialist, uh, superb amongst North American animals and probably can go up against any critter in the world in terms of their acrobatic and uh, climbing abilities. Uh, they're only found in Western North America and as I said, they don't have any close relatives. Here's the range, the entire range of this species anywhere in the world. You can see little bits in the southern U.S. Those are probably remnants from larger distributions back when the land was generally colder. So if you can match up uh, mountains and cold, generally that's where you find mountain goats. And this is sort of the classic view of a mountain goat. Uh, when you find a mountain goat, usually the mountain goat's a lot higher up the hill than you are, and you're looking up, and he's looking down. And, uh, you know, we all uh, recognize that rock climbing is a pretty popular sport. Uh, here's a picture of Aaron sitting in the corner here that he uh, gave me. Uh, usually, though, when people are rock climbing, they have the advantage of fingers and chalk bags and ropes to catch you if you fall. Mountain goats have none of that equipment, but they do have some rather amazing adaptations that allow them to get along pretty well in rocks. And uh, they're actually superb mountaineers. Uh, so if they want to, they can climb darn near anything. And if they can't climb it, they'll just jump on it. <laughs> this is the amazing adaptation, their hoof. Uh, it's got horny outer edges and then soft pads that actually overlap the outer edges under certain circumstances. So it's sort of like a, a giant gecko foot, uh, although it doesn't have any kind of a substance on it. They can use this. They can actually pinch the toe together like a, a human hand might close and get a grip on something instead of just having to be stuck on it. So having feet like that, they have very distinctive tracks. Although they're cloven hoofed, uh, therefore an ungulate, uh, their tracks are kind of squarish. Uh, and typically they'll, they'll stick the toes out so that there's a, a good gap between the toes. Whereas with uh, deer or uh, elk, you might find the toes a little closer together unless they're running. Um, both sexes have horns, and so sometimes it's pretty tough to tell whether you're looking at a nanny goat or a billy goat. Um, just a few of the 
considerations. The bellies generally are larger and stockier, but when you're just looking at one goat, it's hard to tell. Um, and certainly they get uh, uh, bigger and stockier as they're older, so you might have a, a nanny that's bigger than a younger billy that's standing beside her, so you can't use size. The best is the horns themselves. On the billy on the right here, uh, if you kind of look at the space, the white space between the bases of the horns and the white space between the bases of the ear, you'll find there's not as much on a billy as there is on a nanny. Generally, the nannies have thinner horns. Uh, the billy, billies are, are thicker at the base and taper more to the point. Uh, the other thing you can't see on this view is generally the sweep of the horns on the billy is a fairly even curve, whereas nannies often have a straighter base and then uh, they start to curve toward the, the top. So you can see this is a little straighter in here and then curves up here, whereas on this one the billy is curving more uh, all along the way. But it's tough. Uh, anybody who's gone out and tried to identify the sex uh, of a mountain goat, even if you're close range and you're experienced, uh, you don't get it right all the time. Right, Karen? <laughs> Uh, the kids uh, are uh, easily uh, identified by size and very short horns. Uh, interestingly enough, the horns start to grow almost immediately and uh, you can tell the rough age of the kid by looking at the horns. After about a week, week and a half old, the horns will start to show as, as in this uh, young one here. Um, before that, you, you don't see horns. But, uh, so if you see a kid with no horns, it's a very young animal. This uh, picture also illustrates uh, another uh, uh, ability of these animals. They're very stocky. Their legs aren't particularly long. Their, hind, their front quarters are, are massive. And this is, again, an adaptation to being able to climb. Once they're about a year old, uh, their, their horns are roughly their length or just a little past the length of their ears. And then uh, the two-year-olds can also be distinguished. Usually, they're close to adult size by the time they're three. Again, uh, usually when you see goats, uh, they're up in the clouds looking down at you. Uh, this is typical, so this is Disaster Point uh, in Jasper, just uh, west of Hinton here. There's a goat bedded up on the ledge, uh, and it's a long ways down to the highway where I took this picture from. Uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with goats in Jasper, not just because of their association with the mountains, but uh, they're also famous for liking to come down at low elevations to mineral lakes uh, during the, the May-June period. This is uh, the Icefields Parkway at Mount Kirkeslin. Uh, there's an area there where if you go at the right time of the year, you're almost certain to see goats that come down to eat the clay uh, that grow beside the road there. And uh, there's, some, uh, there's a big lake just down over the hill. And then they go across the highway and there's a, a cliff over the bank that drops down to the Athabasca River that they use for escape terrain. Um, one of the features of goats is they always want to be near really steep ground and that's the way they get away from predators. And I'll show you some more about that later. So they tend not to go too far from cliffs and very steep ground, uh, which is where they will retreat to if there's a predator threatening them, except for their taste for minerals where they'll go miles through the bush uh, to find minerals uh, if, if necessary. So here's a very young uh, kid. As I said, you can't see the horns yet, so this animal is probably less than a week and a half years old. Right about the time that the kids are born in late May and early June is the time that the uh, moms uh, start to shed their winter coat. And you can see this nanny uh, has lost most of her winter coat on her head area and it's starting to get shaggy somewhere else too. So in addition, of course, to the traditional mountains, uh, we also sometimes find the kind of escape terrain and habitat conditions in canyons along rivers. This is the Stikine River in uh, north central British Columbia, uh, where it comes out of the Grand Canyon of the Stikine, and if you go upstream from here, it just gets more and more of a canyon. And this is what it looks like a little further up. Uh, there's quite a healthy population of goats that lives in the Stikine River Canyon, uh, several hundred of them. And they, the, the canyon just runs through uh, flat tabletop lands. There's no mountains in, in the vicinity, so these, these goats are canyon dwellers uh, all the time. But if you think about it, they've got the steep terrain they need for escape cover, and they've got access to food and water, so that's all they really need. It doesn't have to be mountains, it's just that's normally where they find those habitat conditions. 
Uh, here's another canyon uh, in BC, the Belcourt River Canyon. Uh, this actually flows down into the, uh, the Kakwa system in Alberta, but uh, this is the canyon on the BC side. These mountain goats live there, also along the Wapiti and the Merrily Rivers up there. Uh, and, uh, of course, the only canyon-dwelling herd that's known in Alberta is the one that lives in Pinnell Creek Canyon. So this is where it's located. Here's Hinton, uh, so about 40 kilometers north is the Pinnell Creek Canyon, and the closest mountains are over here. Now, goats are also famous, especially the young males, uh, for when they leave home, they wander around, they look for other goats, and they look for the kind of habitat that goats are, are happy with. And they wander out from the mountains uh, on a normal basis. And uh, these red dots are sightings that have been recorded on the Hinton FMA over the years. Uh, this is probably how that uh, population of goats in the Pinot Creek Canyon originally got established. A few goats wandered out and found some suitable habitat. And eventually, a small population became established. And it's been there for a long time, so far as we know. Uh, other places uh, you get uh, cliffs and bluffs. Uh, this is the Athabasca River near the mouth of Old Man Creek. And this particular cliff right here, there was a, a billy hung out in here for about eight months before he moved on. And just over the bank from this cliff is this boat. There's a well site there. <laughs> and here he is. And as I said, goats like a skate train. Well, instead of going down to the left over the bank to that cliff I showed you in the previous picture, when this goat was threatened, he climbed up on top of the buildings. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you came in with a pickup uh, and uh, he felt threatened, he'd climb up on top here, and then he felt safe. And he has no problem whatsoever climbing up this. Uh, it's easy. And actually what he did was he hopped up this and then walked along that, hopped on this. And, then on <laughs> and uh, came in once hoping to see him, and uh, there was fresh snow on the, the well site, and uh, there was all kinds of uh, wolf tracks the snow when he was up on top of the, uh, the building. Unfortunately, I didn't have my camera that day. Uh, here's a couple of goats along a pipeline right away just south of the Berlin River a few years ago. One of our summer students took this photo. So they do wander around uh, looking for suitable habitat near, near escape terrain. This is a south to north looking view of the Pinot Creek Canyon. Um, that's probably about a 10 or 12 kilometer stretch. It doesn't look like traditional goat habitat. There's just a series of disjunct cliffs, and uh, but that's enough to support this, this population and has been for quite a while. This is the history. Um, so far as we know, at least back to the 1940s, they've been there. Um, the original Hidden Wood Products uh, uh, Reserve area was established in 1976, just a 600 hectare area around the uh, canyon. There was early oil and gas exploration and some research done in the 80s. And then we expanded it to a special management area in 94. Uh, started looking at research on the goats back then too, so about 15 years ago. We had a master's student named Georgie Harrison come in from UNBC in Prince George, and she did her master's thesis on these goats. Um, we started doing harvesting in the one kilometer area surrounding the goats uh, back in 1996, or no, outside the one kilometer area in 96, uh, increased the reserve area around the goats to 80, uh, 780 hectares in 99, and then in 2000 we nominated the whole area as a protected area under the Alberta Special Places Program. So the Pinot Creek Canyon Natural Area was established in 2000. Then uh, in 2004 we started harvesting within that one kilometer uh, special management area around the goats. And we're just wrapping up the first phase of that uh, as we speak. We just finished harvesting a few weeks ago. So here's the Pinot Creek Canyon. This is uh, cliff C9, and this is typical. Uh, the, this is one of the larger cliffs. So you, you might often find the goats down at the base of the cliff or, or up on top or in the forest immediately adjacent. They don't generally wander too far from the cliffs except when they're moving between cliffs. Uh, Piddle Creek is right at the base where the snow is here, uh, so that's how close this cliff is to the creek. So some of the potential management issues were habitat related. Uh, what's going to happen to the area if mountain pine beetle kills most of the pine in the uh, protected area? What would happen if the forest fire went through there? 
what would happen if we were doing harvesting in the special management area outside the protected area. Uh, concerns particularly related to sensory disturbance, so the noise and, uh, uh, of the operations, would that disturb the goats? Um, would the activities outside or near uh, alter predation rates on the goats? And just general concerns related to a small population size. There's, there's not a lot of animals here, so um, one or two events could cause problems. So what we've done is uh, developed a habitat conservation strategy. Uh, it's now at version five in October 2009. It's about time to update it again. This is what we've used to govern our management of the area around uh, the Pin Creek Canyon. This is a, an aerial view of uh, the yellow is the protected area, the, the canyon, uh, the Pinnacle Creek Canyon natural area, and the green is our special management area around it, and then the white areas here are the harvesting in Vermont 11, 18, and 7. All of the red lines here are GPS goat trails. I'll show you some pictures of those in a minute. So these are the trails that the goats use to move around the area between the cliffs. Um, here's the cliffs all numbered. This was done way back uh, 15 years ago and we've used these same numbers to uh, govern our surveys ever since. This is a depiction of the harvesting in the special management area. The green blocks were done back uh, four or five years ago. The pink in just the last two or three years and this one right here is the one we're just finishing harvesting on right now. When we're done with uh, this round, We'll uh, check to see if the goats are okay, and then we'll be proposing some more activity within this uh, yellow area as part of a new forest management plan, which is due in 2014. Here's a 2010 air photo, so you can see the, uh, the, the recent blocks right in here. All of these colored lines are the survey routes that we use when we're in there trying to do a survey to find out uh, where the goats are and how many there are in, in any particular year. The way we do the surveys, <coughs> Georgie Harrison had a bunch of uh, remote cameras set up. So here's a camera on a tree, a couple of goats taking their own picture. Um, we also collect goat hair, which uh, for a couple of times we used to extract DNA so that we could match up DNA from individual goats with uh, the minimum total count that we got from surveys. That's simply, we do a number of surveys every year and we add up the maximum we see in any uh, age class and sex category. So we'll add up which survey had the most number of kids and we'll say, well, there were at least that many kids this year. Which survey had the most number of billies? There were at least that billies. And then we get a minimum total count. So it's a minimum estimate of how many there were there, but it isn't necessarily the estimate of how many there were there. We don't know exactly how many there were there, but as you'll see from a chart here in a minute, they match up pretty well. So the good news is uh, the population uh, in recent decades has been at and, uh, or near all-time highs. But a word of caution, the data from the 60s, 70s, and 80s was uh, pretty spotty, uh, not as intensively surveyed. So there might just as well have been about this number of goats back then too, or there could have been lower. We just don't know. When you look at the DNA evidence shown in the white bar here with the minimum count data shown in the yellow bars here, that you can see that in the years where there was both, uh, they match up fairly well, which gives us some confidence that the minimum count uh, method uh, works fairly well. But there's going to be some issues. So for example, uh, in 2009, we had a minimum count of 36, and that jumped to 49 the next year. I don't believe that 13 goats suddenly appeared. I suspect that the, the number in 2009 was probably higher. We just didn't detect as many as we did the next year. And same in 2011. It looks like it's way down, but uh, only did two surveys last year, unfortunately. And uh, the one time I did the survey, there were two good-sized groups of goats right there, fresh. I, uh, I could smell them, but I never saw them, so I, I missed them. So last year's total is I'm very confident and underestimate, but what it tells me is I've got to get out there this year and, and uh, see if I can get that bar back up. So uh, here's the canyon. Uh, this is the, the north end. Uh, this one here is, uh, is Cliff 1. That's uh, Cliff 2 here. You can see that it's uh, not really what you would call a classic river canyon, but it's enough for the goats. 
This is the same cliffs viewed down from along the river. Here's cliff two, cliff one over there. Cliff one's the largest cliff in the whole system. Here's Spindle Creek. Here's some other smaller cliffs upstream of there. You'll find goats along all of these, and typically they have a trail that runs right along the uh, bluff through the forest. The canyon in some places has hoodoo formations, which are, are pretty uh, nice, and the goats like them too, as I'll show you in a little bit. Red. Yep. I have a question. Um, I missed Rick. What, what do they eat? Goats? Yeah. Goats eat darn near anything. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> they eat gravel. Yeah. Preferably frozen gravel. <laughs> it's got minerals on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah they, uh, they're very, uh, very Catholic in their diet. They'll, they'll, eat, they'll eat darn near anything. Uh, uh, if there's a wind thrown uh, pine tree in the winter, they'll strip it bare, for example. Um, generally, though, they don't go too far from the escape terrain to, to forage, so they'll usually within, be within 100 meters or, or less. So I'll show you some pictures of places where they can forage. So in relation to the escape terrain, they don't have a feeding, typical feeding area. It can be just anywhere along there. Yeah, they'll feed right around, usually on or within not too far of the escape terrain where they, they forage, although sometimes you'll see them uh, further away. So here's a typical tra a series of trail shots. These are all very well-worn trails. Uh, when Georgie Harrison was doing her work and had cameras on these, she's got lots of uh, pictures of the goats using them. Uh, they are narrow trails and they follow along, and uh, as you'll see, uh, you can tell the goats have been using them by tracks and also by hair. Here's another one. So these areas here are not escape terrain, and obviously the goats are more vulnerable when they're moving between uh, cliffs along these uh, trail systems. Uh, they quite readily take advantage of uh, human features. This is a seismic line from that 1980s exploration, and uh, I'm pretty sure that goat trail wasn't there before the seismic line. It's the opposite. The seismic line came first, and then the goats uh, decided to use it as a trail afterwards. <coughs> Um, in the summer, in addition to droppings, you start to see these uh, features here. These are, are beds, so they're pawing out the, the loose dirt and then uh, lying down and having a, a soft, cool dirt, but also a bit of a dust bath. Get pretty dirty in the summer. This is uh, just above one of the cliffs uh, in, the, uh, in the late winter, and you can see that there's not a lot left there to eat. They ate most of everything that was close by to the cliff. Now you'll get a green flush of vegetation again next year, and, but at the end of the winter, most of the groceries close to the cliffs have been eaten. So long at the end of the winter, uh, you're still going to find uh, groups uh, of goats. Uh, they have a social structure that is uh, female dominated. So the females, young goats and kids will normally be in small groups, and the billies get kicked out on their own or with a buddy and the only time there's interaction between the, uh, the adult females and the adult males is during the breeding season. And even then, the, uh, the females dominate the males. Um, so uh, the nanny had better like her suitor or else there isn't going to be a tryst. <laughs> so as I said, right around the end of May, early June is when the uh, uh, Nannies will go off by themselves and have their kids in a secluded location. This one's not very old, you can't see any horns yet. And uh, Nanny hasn't really started the shed yet. So right about the time that the kids are born is when the shedding activity starts. And here's another, this is the kid's not very old. Nanny's lost all her winter fur off her uh, face. Uh, the kids start climbing right away and uh, mom's a good, uh, place to practice, nice soft. And pretty soon, within a week or two, uh, even though they're still being uh, uh, nursed, uh, they'll be on uh, to green food. And you can see the aspen is just leafing out here, so this kid's not very old. Uh, they had no idea I was there taking their pictures, uh, just uh, you know, maybe 30 meters above them. And uh, I was kind of concentrating on them, trying to get a good picture through the brush. And, then I realized uh, there was something else between me and them. This guy. Oh, cool. <laughs> a marmot popped out of his hole. So here's the goat, and the marmot's right here. Uh, 
so you never know what you're going to see when you're doing one of these surveys. 